Thank you, thank you. Thank you to uh, all these wonderful organizers for inviting me to come and speak to you guys today. I'm fairly close by. I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere near Toledo. Um, so this is, you know, a, a place that I really, really like and a conference that I always enjoy coming to. Um, I was supposed to do the morning keynote and we, Chris and I switched and I'm not really sure which way is better because he has a very uplifting talk <laughs> and this is going to depress the hell out of you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we'll be stress eating and drinking afterwards. So it's, it's just going to, all of it'll make sense. Um, so I thought I'd start, I'd start, I usually start out this presentation with a little bit of a story. Um, about, at this point, it's been about seven years ago. Um, I was married. I had two kids. I lived even further in the middle of nowhere in a little town called Rocky Ridge, which, um, a lot of people think of Rocky River when, when I say Rocky Ridge, but no, this was kind of like a glorified trailer park, uh, in the middle of nowhere near where I live now. Um, the house I was in, uh, like, had been, um, handed down in my, my husband's family and the roof leaked. There was like mold and he just was not a very clean person when I was when we were together. Um, and without going into like super intimate details, I wasn't really in control of a lot of what happened in my life at the time. Um, my second son at the time was about one years old and my oldest was seven. And, uh, I, I remember the one night I kind of realized there was something wrong with me other than the stuff that I already knew was wrong with me. Uh, I had just gotten out of the shower. Um, I, I just right there, right then and there, like broke down on the floor, sobbing, crying. I couldn't speak. This is exactly how I felt. Um, just like static inside my brain. I, it physically hurt to try and talk and say why, why I was crying and what was happening inside my head. Fast forward hour later or so, I was calmed down. I was able to talk again. I, it was the stupidest thing ever, but it was just because the shower curtain was dirty. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the stupidest thing to, like, just complete emotional breakdown, right? Just ruined my night um, just because of that one stupid thing that I probably could have fixed fairly easily. Yeah, the straw that broke the camel's back, right. So I, I, I felt super immature and, and stupid and, and looking back at all of that now, a lot of my anxiety problems were because of, uh, things being unclean. Um, I'm like, I'm not a super neat freak right now, but that was, that was way too much. Um, if you ever seen hoarders, it was almost that bad. Um, but even when I realized something was wrong internally, I never asked for help. I thought I could just deal with it myself. I had fixed all my other problems myself. Um, and I had, you know, I had gotten through so much at the ripe age of 25 that I should be able to just handle everything myself and I'd be fine. So why in the world am I bringing this up here? Um, well, because I consider a lot of you in this community my family and more so than a lot of the blood relation that I have. Um, it's the first group of people that I've had that have understood, like, being bullied growing up and, you know, ne maybe never fitting in, in social circles and just, uh, a lot of us have been through the same kind of scenarios and as adults kind of are as well, but now we're all antisocial together. Uh, <laughs> woo! <laughs> um, and then this is, uh, you know, I started tweeting and posting on Facebook and stuff about anxiety and depression and just the outpouring flood of people saying that, oh, my God, I have this, too. Let, like, let's talk about it. And just sharing stories back and forth. It, it was amazing the amount of people in our community that also deal with a lot of mental health problems. So I thought covering it. Um, in like an official capacity would kind of uh, get rid of some of the stigma that a lot of us have to deal with when dealing with mental health problems. Um, let's see here. So, uh, yeah, the, a lot of us, and, and I get this a lot, are the kind of people that look like you have it together um, and uh, are, are the people that need it the most. So we, we never want to admit anything is wrong with us, right? Uh, so what's the first step of almost any 12-step program? 
acknowledgement, acceptance, whatever, right? Um, so if you accept it and stop there, you still have a problem. <laughs> um, you know, you, it'll just make you more angry and depressed, the fact that you know that you're depressed um, if you don't actually do anything about it. And not do, not not only do people in our industry have the normal stresses that that other jobs do, um, you know we take we take stress on from family and financial things and um, you know your boss you, you know your day to day job, but we you know this is uh, this is our career this is our passion. Hopefully none of you are here because you have to be, because sorry <laughs> I guess you can wait another hour before you have to leave. Um, and, and, you know, our, the InfoSec community is hard to compare to any other. A lot of us uh, have all of this drive that we sit behind our computers and we don't talk to people. And, you know, we, we throw ourselves into our work in forms of research and um, just this passionate drive to, to accomplish something, right, based on, a, uh, you know, all of the talks that we've seen today. All of those people have a drive to complete something, and a lot of times you just throw yourself into that work. Uh, and if sometimes you can add roles like incident response where, um, you know, it, Certain incident response roles, you're dealing with human trafficking and um, abuse cases and stuff like that, and and that can be that can be some really really tough stuff to have to deal with on your own, um, and you're under an NDA, so it's it's not like you can go home and talk about it or you know in, in public, right? <clears throat> Uh, so let's talk about some of the uh, research I was able to do next. I never thought I'd read so many medical journals. <laughs> At one point, I wanted to be like a uh, orthopedic orthopedic surgeon, but after I gave that up, I didn't think I'd have to read any more medical journals. Um, so the first thing I did was searched on um, mental health issues in STEM fields, and holy cow, um, most of them were about women. <laughs> uh, no matter what you read into that, um, I think it's just because, I mean, we talk about it a lot more. So when I removed the the, the uh, term women from the search, it went from 6 million results down to 2 million. So it's a pretty significant uh, uh, shift in, in uh, focus there. Um, and really when it comes to mental illness, the, we're different. Um, women are more likely to be diagnosed with things like anxiety or depression, while men tend towards things like substance abuse or antisocial disorders. Um, and then, uh, but nobody wants to talk about the men, even though, what, like 70% of our industry is men, right? Not, not a lot of you want to talk about it. Um, but the hypothesis I was trying to prove is that it seems like people in STEM, and I mean, in our case, in InfoSec, have a higher rate of mental health issues. Um, and it turns out there's actually a few studies that provide evidence to that. Uh, the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis actually is, is a hypothesis on just that. Um, and there's a quote from that. It states, uh, the finding of an association between progressively increasing risk of bipolar disorder and higher arithmetic intellectual performance is rather surprising. <laughs> um, High scorers with such rapid processing power may also share a tendency to experience mania and a high state state of focus and uh, psychomotor activity. So they actually did a study um, uh, over a fairly long amount of time of people like in graduate programs or, or you know uh, more intellectual fields and found that just a lot of us are uh, uh, self medicating. Um, and we self-medicate with alcohol and drugs more than the average person. And it, so how many of you are Mr. Robot fans? Right, yeah. So not, not too much of a spoiler, I guess, and even so, it's been out for a while, so too bad. Uh, <laughs> you should go watch it. Anyways, um, it shows you kind of how much research they put into it because the main character, Elliot, um, suffers from uh, depression, social anxiety disorder, delusions, paranoia, that kind of stuff. And he self-medicates with morphine, uh, like microdoses with morphine, and then comes down off of that using Suboxone. Um, well, I don't recommend doing that <laughs> at all if you have any problems or not. Uh, uh, it's a just, uh, it's a good, um, uh, it's a just a good part of that paper. 
Uh, so let's move on to some more statistics. Um, <laughs> every time I sit there peeling, peeling this off, I think of the slide, and this is exactly true, right? Um, and there was a study done recently at Berkeley that found between 42 and 48% of PhD candidates suffer from depression compared to about 7% of the average population. So that makes sense with the Google results. Um, there's significantly more results uh, involving women because one, we report it more, and two, people like to focus on minorities. And I don't want to try and focus on men, but really in this case you are the minority because you're not reporting it. Um, it's not like you guys aren't having issues. I definitely know some of you. <laughs> uh, you're just not reporting them. So uh, it's hard to give this this part of the talk overseas <laughs> because nobody really cares about the U.S. stats. <laughs> um, but this is just a little bit more statistics um, uh, from the CDC. And all of this, and we still think that everybody has it together better than we do. Um, I know I'm guilty of it. Uh, a handful of people have already done talks and research and stuff on imposter syndrome. Chris is being one of them that he brings up a lot of these, you know, how, how to think through a lot of this, which is super helpful. Um, and that can go, hand, you know, imposter syndrome can go hand in hand um, sometimes with anxiety and depression. Um, it's just the feeling that so many people have it together and you don't. Um, you can feel like you're drowning while everybody else is, is doing great, and that's not necessarily always the case. Uh, so I can think of a good amount of people that have talked me through situations like this, um, as well as all of the times I've been limited because of my own anxiety. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I found that the U.S. Preventative Services uh, Task Force recommends that all adults be screened for depression. It's all of us. Like, that's in incredible. When, when I read that, my mind went in a million different directions. I thought, okay, all of us. All is it, Okay, maybe it's just U.S. citizens. <laughs> maybe they just want U.S. citizens to be screened for depression. Is it first world problems? Is it, uh, is it our diet? Is it our government? What is it? Probably our government has a lot to do with it. But, <laughs> I mean, in the grand scheme of things, we don't really have it that bad. Right? Like, we're all fairly healthy and sitting here and drinking and, you know, in a fairly air-conditioned room. And, you know, it, definitely you think of it as a first-world problem. And it's not something that you should be struggling with. But that's not, um, it's not the first thing that crosses your mind when you're, you know, in a, in a huddled mess on the floor. So I'm going to dive a little bit into um, the different types of mental health issues and their characteristics. I'm not going to cover everything um, because I didn't, I, I'm not, def, I, I do infosec. I don't do uh, counseling or, or psychology or anything like that. I actually gave this talk once and had like a psychologist in the room <laughs> and they came up after me and they're like, you know what, you should probably change this, this, and this because that's not really right, which that was perfect feedback, right? That's, you know, that's the feedback that you want to get from a person like that. Uh, so first off, there's social anxiety disorder. Um, some common symptoms are uh, fear of situations which you may be judged, like standing on stage, um, worrying about embarrassing or humiliating yourself, uh, concern that you'll offend someone, intense fear of interacting or talking with strangers, uh, fear of physical symptoms that may cause you embarrassment, like blushing, sweating, um, having a shaky voice, stumbling over your words, uh, a good example of this is I will continue to uh, review my performance that I that I just gave on stage for it and forever how long it takes me to get drunk and then I'll forget about it. Um, and then avoiding situ situations where you might be the center of attention, like being on stage. <laughs> um, you can have anxiety in anticipation of an event. You don't, you know, you'll, you can spend time afterwards, uh, af after that social event, just analyzing, identifying flaws in your interactions. Like, did I accidentally touch this person and offended them? Did I, um, you know, look at somebody the wrong way? I, I went to New Zealand and a great, a great example of this is, so they, they drive on the other side of the road 
And I made a very conscious effort to walk on the correct side when you're walking on like the sidewalk because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. Like if you're going to the grocery store, you know, you're, you're doing it like you're driving if you're pushing a cart. I did the same thing there, just switched because I was just so worried that people were going to like, like, oh, what a dumb American. She's walking on the wrong side of the sidewalk, which doesn't make any sense, right? It's all in my head, but the fact that it's there is definitely <laughs> can be, can be a, a limiting factor. And you might say to yourself that these things happen to you every now and then, but all of these specify that it's that, that they're intense fears. Um, I know I'm not a doctor, but if you experience, you know, the disclaimer, if you experience any of these, go see one. Don't just ask me because, again, I've only done a little bit of research. Well, that's their expertise. <clears throat> um, you can, you know, avoid social situations like, using a public restroom, interacting with strangers, eating in public. I had a friend that um, would actually uh, eat in her cubicle uh, and never never went out uh, went, never went out to lunch with us, never did anything because she had just in, uh, this intense fear of people watching her chew. Um, so you know that that's a limiting factor. you know it's it's really something that's in her brain and and uh, causing her um, to have to stay there and, and eat, right? Uh, this one is so me. Uh, <laughs> li living in the middle of nowhere, there's not really a whole lot to do. Um, and when I don't have my kids, I like scroll and see if I can find things to do. I usually have to either drive to Cleveland or Detroit because Toledo doesn't really have anything. Um, <laughs> other than Justin. Oh, Justin. Uh, <laughs> um, so an another very limiting factor to this would be dating. And I can tell you in small town in your 30s. Uh, it is its own kind of separate hell. Uh, adding anxiety to small town minds and just like just this. Just, I just don't want to go anywhere at, that, at most points. Um, other things like uh, going to work or school, entering a room which people are already seated. Um, I've, I remember being in college and, you know, the class had already started. I was a few minutes late and they had started I, w I left. I wasn't going to go in because I couldn't handle going. And at this point, I didn't even realize I had a problem. <laughs> um, I, I just didn't want to go in because I knew by the time I opened the door and made that noise, everybody was going to turn around and look at me. Um, I don't know how many relationships I've ruined. Not 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 ro like romantic relationships, but like professional relationships, friendships, everything. Um, because of my panic and anxiety attacks, even even after I was diagnosed and started taking medication, um, anything that's m more than like a strictly business relationship, because uh, I concoct these horrible scenes and 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 situations in my head that I think are happening but really aren't. <laughs> I hope you don't have social anxiety because that was uh, no. <laughs> Um, and yet again, this isn't just me talking, but people have different levels of anxiety and depression and other mental health issues, right, that I'll, that I'll talk to you about in a minute, and they deal with them uh, in different ways. Uh, but a huge, a, a huge common theme is overthinking pretty much everything and being around people. So next up is major depressive disorder. Um, it's one of the most talked about mental health issues out there. A lot of people will associate with this uh, just being sad. Um, I listen to a really good podcast called The Hilarious World of Depression. They have on there a lot of times um, comedians and stuff like that that have, uh, you know, uh, used um, comedy and humor and stuff to get, a, get around their depression or, or help themselves work with it. Really, really recommend it. Um, and and I, re I recently listened to one that um, uh, there was a uh, lady that didn't realize that she had depression. She just thought that's how everybody felt. Um, but it's actually the, uh, according to a recent um, World Health Organization study, it is one of the uh, leading causes of physical uh, Ill illness in the world. You have feelings of sadness, tearfulness, angry outbursts, irritability, um, loss of interest in, or, or pleasure in most normal activities. Uh, sleep, deter sleep disturbances, uh, and it can range from anything from insomnia to just never getting out of bed. 
tiredness, lack of energy, anxiety. Uh, <laughs> um, see, I told you this is a really <laughs> depressing talk. I try my best to put like <laughs> memes and stuff to not make it so bad. Um, feeling of worthlessness or guilt, fixating on past failures, slowed thinking, slowed speaking, our body movements. Trouble thinking, concentrating, remembering things, unexplained physical problems. So this isn't just all in our head, right? It's the, it's the leading cause of physical illness in the world. People are actually experience lots of physical symptoms when they have uh, depression. Like back pain, headaches, that kind of stuff. It just goes along with all of it. So this is a super fun one. Uh, uh, it's bipolar disorder, also known as manic depression. And there's two sides to this one. Um, first off, there's the manic part. Um, you can be abnormally upbeat, jumpy, increased activity, increased energy. Um, you can be agitated all the time. And you can have this exaggerated self, uh, sense of self-being or um, uh, well-being, sorry, and self-confidence, like, like a euphoric type feeling. Um, you'll have a uh, decreased need for sleep. Uh, usually you're super talkative, uh, <laughs> distractibility, and a big one is poor decision making. People will go on buying sprees, take huge sexual risks, make foolish investments, just everything that you can think of that, like, sometimes in the back of your mind you think that, that would be awesome if I could do that, but you know the risks involved. Um, that risk behavior is kind of thrown out the window when, when you're in a manic state. And then the second part are um, uh, the like the bipolar uh, the bipolar spectrum, right? Um, that that depressive state is everything that I already listed uh, when talking about depression. Uh, and and earlier I had a conversation um, specifically about suicide. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're manic depressive, when you're, when you have anxiety, depression, um, a, a lot of mental health issues, you, you, I mean, people, people turn to suicide. Like we've seen like a, a lot of people in the public, right? Um, there was, uh, Anthony Bernane, uh, Kate Spade, people, you know, off themselves all the time because of depression. And, um, uh, in the conversation we we're having, it was, uh, pointed out that some people think that that's like the easy way out, <laughs> but I can tell you it is not. Uh, it is very, very intense decision that that person makes, um, and it's not something that they can that they can control. They think they're actually doing the world better because, you know, most people can have a shitty day and like, all right, tomorrow's going to be better. Tomorrow's going to be better. Be better. But when you're depressed or you're you're dealing with this day in and day out, um, you really think that that's the only answer. Uh, next up is PTSD. Um, and this is a mental health uh, uh, condition that's triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing it or witnessing it. So a lot of, um, a lot of people in the military have PTSD, right? You can also have it from uh, being raped, wit witnessing murder, um, anything else like that, and you you end up having uh, recurring unwanted uh, memories and like flashbacks of of the event. Uh, upsetting dreams or nightmares about the event, and then severe emotional stress uh, uh, of something that reminds you of that event that has caused your PTSD. Uh, next is borderline personality disorder. Uh, it's also called uh, disassociative identity disorder, and this is the one that I really messed up, and the, and the psychologist called, told, told me that I needed to fix my slides um, because uh, I made too many correlations in between this and being bipolar. It's definitely different. Um, with this, you have uh, you can have unstable, intense relationships with people because... Um, you have this intense fear of an, of abandonment that somebody's going to leave you, and you'll do you'll you'll go through extreme measures to avoid that abandonment um, because you just constantly think that you're going to be rejected. That's just one of the symptoms, right? Um, you could have rapid changes in self identity and self image that have you shifting your goals 
and values and and you can see yourself as uh, either being like the worst person in the world or that you literally don't exist at all um, and shifts between different personalities often are accompanied by blackout periods um, has anybody ever read the Dark Tower series by Stephen King no, all right. The, well, this probably won't make a whole lot of sense to you, but <laughs> there's a character in there named, um, uh, was it Savannah? I think. Su uh, Suzanne. And, uh, uh, she has personality disorder and doesn't, you know, each, each personality doesn't know who the other is. And they're, they're very, very different people. Um, and they do a really good job in the book of, of, uh, going through, like, the inner thoughts and, um, uh, personality issues that that person would have. Um, you can have wild mood swings lasting a few hours or a few days. Inappropriate or intense anger, like frequently losing your temper, being sarcastic or bitter, having physical fights. Um, and the personalities a lot of times are created as a coping mechanism. Um, to something, a lot of times it's uh, like when they were younger. They, you know, had a very traumatic childhood, and they and they created those other personalities as a coping mechanism. Um, one of the worst cases of childhood schizophrenia is a seven uh, seven year old little girl named Janie, and she was diagnosed in two thousand nine. Um, in her case, in her hallucinations, uh, they took um, uh, the form of like imaginary children and other animals. And she had this little friend uh, that was her, um, named Twenty Four Hours. Uh, she had a rat named Wednesday, a cat named and a cat named Four Hundred that told her to do bad things, and if she didn't do it, they would scratch her and bite her until she did. Um, she had a younger brother. Her mom and dad had to stay up twenty four seven with her, and they just slept in shifts because. Um, uh, she would cut and bite and scratch and and want to like physically at seven years old like physically kill her little brother just because of this mental health issue. I mean that's that is you know one end of the spectrum, right? That's that's one of the most um, intense cases that they have out there, but that's insane. Um, her her um, oh uh, her doctor said that he over, over the years he had met over two hundred different. Cats, rats, dogs, birds, other little girls um, that only only she could see. And she was also incredibly self-harming, um, already attempting suicide several times at the age, age of seven. Uh, there's obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, it features a pattern of unreasonable thoughts and fears, which are the obsessions, that lead you to do repetitive behaviors, which are the compulsions. Um, one of the most uh, famous people with OCD is Nikola Tesla. He would have to walk around a building three times before entering it. He wouldn't eat alone with women. He had an intense fear of circle-shaped objects. Um, and he had to have everything divided by three. If he went to a hotel room, it had to be something that, you know, it was a number that divided by three if he would stay there. Um, another case was in the 1800s of this young lady she would wash her hands compulsively 200 times a day, at least 200 times a day, due to fear of contamination. Um, there's another one in the 1800s that was, a, uh, her name was Joanna. She was obsessed with the thought that she would actually um, uh, cheat on her husband. And she was happily married and had no desire to have an affair, but she, her OCD and, and thoughts were so bad that if you would walk up to her and say, I know you cheated on your husband. She would instantly believe you. Uh, she actually created her own chastity belt that only her husband had. Fun fact. So things like fear of contamination or dirt, needing things orderly and, and symmetrical, and that's not like I like to have things in spreadsheets or I like, you know, a certain brand of toilet paper. No, it is, it is intense, very intense, like life-ruining intense. Um, when you have to deal with OCD. Um, another another um, characteristic is you could also have uh, aggressive or, or horrific thoughts of harming yourself or others and unwanted, um, unwanted, unwanted thoughts, including just playing um, 
super aggressive behavior, horrible things that you may do and not, not want to do, but you, you think that you may do um, uh, in your head over and over and over again. <laughs> this is in another half hour. Uh, so while well, we can agree that any of these conditions just royally suck, so now what? What do we do if you or someone you love or care about um, are experiencing some of these symptoms? How do you cope with them, or how do you help them cope? Um, a while back, uh, when I first started giving this talk, I put out a survey with about 20 different, about 20, completely like informal survey. Uh, uh, asking about 20 different questions on people's uh, perception and personal ideas about mental health. So several of the responses are up here. Um, another uh, uh, great example of my anxiety is I, uh, I kind of messed up one of the questions. It was, uh, oh, I think I have it in here. Oh, yeah. Do you participate in any activities to reduce, dull, or improve the stress or feelings you're having, such as alcohol, prescription drugs, other drugs, Exercise, medication, or other. I'm. I had. Uh, I had made that question a multiple choice. It wasn't a multiple answer. So I had already had like 200 people fill out the questionnaire, and they're like, "Hey, I do lots of these things. I do all of the drugs and all of the things, and I I wanted to do all of those. If I would have taken it myself, the 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 survey before sending it out, I would have realized that because I do the same thing." And then I just spent the rest of the day thinking about how much I fucked up that question. So out of the 860 responses I got, these were the results. Um, I think out of the other category, my favorite responses were uh, pretend to be a Vulcan, uh, masturbation, cats, and Twitter. Or maybe all at the same time. I don't know. So there are a lot, <laughs> there are a lot of different coping and relaxation methods that you can take to deal with this stuff, including medicine. And here you see earlier the hypothesis of people in our field really like to self-medicate. Um, and when I started this, I reached out to a friend of mine who's actually a mental health counselor for his day job. And uh, I want you to tell me, what is the quickest way to improve your brain chemistry? There's two ways to improve your brain chemistry without using drugs. Anybody know? Exercise is one. Sex is the other. Exactly. Only if you're doing it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I use, I use my mom as a sounding board for a lot of the stuff that I talk about, which is sometimes great because I love making her blush and I love making her shake her head at me. And when I started talking about different coping mechanisms, prescription drugs and stuff like that, um, she mentioned her grandma. So at the time, I guess she had been institutionalized around, I think it was like around 50 or so, um, and for like her withdrawn behavior. And it was like during menopause, she obviously was just going through some depression. And at that time, her treatment was they just gave her shock treatments. So it's nothing like trying to get out of depression, just like shocking the hell out of you all the time. Um, but now we have better options, right? Uh, people talk kind of sarcastically about safe safe spaces when, uh, okay, so I have to point this out. I get the, in I had to have a conference formally apologize for me because they thought I was racist when I put this up there. I want to, I know people that say they're not racist shouldn't, I just, I, I, I'm sorry for anybody <laughs> that offends, just putting that out there. <clears throat> oh, you can't even, oh yeah, yeah, you can't see the punchline. All right, good. I was just worried like, yeah, never mind. All right. So we make fun of uh, like millennials when talking about safe spaces, but I can I, I think we can all agree that not a lot of people need like traditional safe spaces, but it's good to have somebody to talk to if needed, whether it just be a close friend or a group of people or whatever. Um, even if you don't use that as a coping mechanism, it can kind of still feel good to externalize your feelings. A lot of times, if I don't have anybody to talk to or I don't want to talk to anybody, I just write shit down and cry myself to sleep. No, I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm only kind of joking about that. Um, so back then, like when I was talking about my great grandma, you couldn't really talk about those things, just like you couldn't talk about, um, so you couldn't talk about anything mental health related, right? You couldn't talk about teen pregnancy. You couldn't talk about divorce. I've had all three and I can talk about all of them. So I'm glad to live in this century. 
Um, so not only can you talk to people in your field about your thoughts and feelings and research and what you're doing in your day job, um, a lot of people kind of want professional opinions too. So uh, I always recommend going and talking to like a therapist, psychologist, whatever uh, have you, if, if you don't think uh, just writing about it or talking about it with you know, the person sitting next to you uh, is working. So back to getting all doped up. Uh, the last 20 years, we've seen a 400% increase in the use of antidepressants, uh, with an estimated 1 in 10 adults now taking them. And while we don't want to really devalue people's suffering, we also don't want to be that quick to throw pills at an issue that might not need it, um, which is great that people are medita meditating and exercising and hacking and learning and doing all this stuff themselves to relieve some of the stress, um, because a lot of those things increase your dopamine levels automatically with the, without the need of anything artificial. Um, when I was first uh, prescribed Zoloft, this is the kind of exper um, uh, explanation that I got from my doctor. Just that it's like a simple chemical reaction in your brain and the drug is going to do something to fix that, right? Um, which I wholeheartedly took as gospel until I started doing a lot of this research. Because, I mean, it, it logically made a lot of sense um, because, you know, biologically something's not working right and they're going to put another chemical in there to make it make it right, right? Um, but during the research, I found out that that's not necessarily 100% true. Um, from what I found in, like, the medical journals and articles and everything that I read, I read uh, a lot of those doctors have no idea why any of this works. They're just throwing chemicals at you to see if you react which, all right, I get that science is hard. Um, the studies that I read pointed out that issues also arise from things like faulty mood regulation by the brain, genetic vulnerability, um, stressful life events, other medications, other medical problems, stuff like that. So there's, there was actually an American Psychological Association article that I liked the, uh, the quote out of. It says, um, we do not dispute the possibility that neurotransmitters and other brain chemicals play a significant role in the etiology of depression. However, we are also concerned that the chemical imbalance explanation may not reflect the full range of causes of depression, may be given greater credence by both consumers and practitioners than, it's, than is supported by sound research, and or may be understood in an overly simplistic manner. So, but really, what part, I mean, most parts of medical science do we not receive already in an oversimplistic manner unless we specifically ask. So I started taking Zola. Oh my God, there's my dinosaur head. <laughs> so I left that at a friend's house that lived in Cleveland. Uh, and now it's, now it's here. All right. Uh, completely just threw me off. Uh, so <laughs> I started taking Zoloft about six months before the end of my marriage, and it was amazing. Uh, I wasn't sad anymore. I was able to like get up and do stuff. I had energy, and uh, it. But it also kind of made me a zombie. Um, I was just dead inside. <laughs> I had zero emotions. I wasn't happy. I wasn't sad. I was just kind of like existing. Um, so for two years, that really helped me get through a lot of stress, uh, and it was fantastic until I decided that it might be good to actually feel something again. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, and medications, yeah, medications have different effects on different people. That had that effect on me. It's worked fabulously for other people. You know, it's, it's just like I said, the doctors are throwing medication at you. We all have different physiology, and we're just seeing what works. <clears throat> So after all of the major stress died down, I switched to uh, Wellbutrin and like the occasional Xanax, and which for me has worked incredibly well so far. Um, and now I'm not saying that everybody should be medicated, but it did work for me. Um, and honestly, a lot of people are are coping in way unhealthier ways than than taking medication. So it's definitely a, a good option that you should uh, consider if you need to. So what other coping mechanisms are out there for us to possibly work on? Um, <laughs> uh, even properly medicated mental health can be a struggle sometimes. Um, uh, talking about that podcast again, during one of the episodes, the guest said that uh, she deals with her anxiety by naming it Steve. 
Uh, and that way, Steve is just this dumb friend that she doesn't need to listen to, and it's great for managing her anxiety because Steve is the stupid one telling her all of these horrible things in her head, and just because that's a stupid guy over there that you could just say, no, Steve, you're stupid, I don't have to listen to you, uh, it really worked for her, and that's really what a lot of child psychologists use if children have anxiety as well. <laughs> Other times crying, um, even if I haven't chosen to do it, helps. Um, there's actually, this This I found really, really cool. There's a biochemist. He's a tear expert. Uh, his name is Dr. William Frey at the Ramsey Medical Center in Minneapolis. He discovered that reflex tears are 98% water, whereas emotional tears contain a stress hormone that excretes from the body when you cry. And he, he like just studies the composition of tears, and he found that emotional tears shed those hormones and other toxins which accumulate during stress. And additional studies also suggest that crying simulates the production of endorphins, which are na our body's natural painkiller and feel-good hormones. Uh, crying makes us feel better, uh, even when a problem persists. And um, he would say that patients sometimes, well, please, please excuse me for crying. I'm trying really hard not to. It makes me feel weak. You know, my heart goes out to those people because I know where that statement comes from. Um, you know, I've, I've been uncomfortable crying. I'm still uncomfortable crying in front of people. And there's a slide in here that I'm going to try really hard not to cry on at the end. And I've only managed to do it once. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, crying can release a lot of, uh, toxins in your body when you're feeling stressed. Uh, I've personally used breathing exercises like this, um, and things like, uh, binaural beats and other meditation, uh, sorry, meditation, um, that there's, there's a million YouTube videos for. You can just plug in and say, I want a, uh, anti-anxiety YouTube video, and there's just a shit ton of them out there made by professionals that, I mean, some of them actually work sometimes. And there's this thing called the 54321 coping technique. Um, and I'm, I'm going to walk through these. Feel free to either practice to try something new or save it for later. So five is you acknowledge five things around you that you can see, either big, small, whatever. Just recognize and list to yourself five, five items you can see. Um, number four, acknowledge four things around you that you can touch. Check with your neighbor first <laughs> before you touch them. Uh, but things like your computer, your chair, your phone, your watch, your hair, whatever, just four things that you can touch. Uh, acknowledge three things around you that you can hear. So fan, me, chairs moving, people walking, you know, conversations, whatever, three things that you can hear. Um, acknowledge two things that you can smell. Speaking of your neighbor, <laughs> uh, hopefully not them. Um, uh, yeah, so you can like walk around. Like if you can't really smell anything now because your nose is acclimated, go outside, smell some flowers, um, go smell a beer, whatever. So it's two things that you can smell. And the last one can go two different ways. I've seen, I've seen two different implementations of this. Um, you can either acknowledge one positive thing around you that you can taste or acknowledge one positive thing about yourself. Um, so building up, building up yourself is, is always something that's, uh, very healthy to do. And considering where we all are, um, you know, you can do it while you're in your chair. And then I also recommend, you know, doing the whole breathing exercises because that can help really calm me down. So now we've covered a whole bunch of my personal baggage uh, and different coping mechanisms. We can look about look at uh, how we treat others that might be struggling, um, our loved ones, family, friends, coworkers, anything like that. Uh, as I've said before, I've talked to an amazing amount of people that all that deal with this kind of stuff and uh, how they how they uh, uh, talk to others about how to help them. Right. Um, I've gotten a huge range of responses from people. Um, and several of them really, really can help me during because I, I can now tell when I have an anxiety attack coming on. And so that makes it so I can verbalize it more in the beginning anyways. Um, but a lot of the responses that I got from people um, were just negative, negative responses to when they've either asked for help or talked about their issues. And one of the most common negative things people say is that you're overreacting. 
it's not going to help. <laughs> definitely. Um, and I'm definitely not the one, only one that happens for sure. I've, I've heard that a lot. I get this a lot. Uh, every, anytime I tell anybody that I've struggled with anxiety or depression, they're like, uh, especially from my mom, like, I, I have nothing to complain about. I have three healthy kids. I have a fantastic career. I published author. I'm here to speak. I'm fairly healthy. Minus the knee thing. Uh, just, I, I don't really have anything to complain about. So, how, and I'm, I am seem happy most of the time, right? So how could I be struggling from anxiety and depression? But you know what? I've said the exact same thing to people that have told me that. Even though I hear it all the time. I, you know, I have, some of my best friends have dealt with it and I'm like, oh, wow, well, you just seem so happy. You have everything going for you. Why would you be depressed? I do the same thing. So it's, it's definitely a common reaction. Um, it's just not, uh, uh, very helpful in the long run. Or a second one that people like to say is try thinking happier thoughts. And I forgot that I bolded the wrong one, but. So I only wish that were possible. Um, you can't just will yourself when you might have a chemical imbalance or other potential reason. Um, your brain is just firing a certain way, and you, no matter how hard you want to will yourself out of that bed, it's not going to happen. It's super easy to put a happy face on the outside, but that doesn't mean you're fixing any of your issues. And like I said before, um, a good amount of mental health issues come with their own physical symptoms. You can't just tell someone to make more of an effort. So now I've gotten both the both the positive and negative stories uh, of the interactions around mental health. But almost everyone I've talked to over the last few years um, have have surprised people when they've brought up the fact that they they're dealing with things. Um, and I've been told in a few cases that those people have been uh, um, uh, shamed into thinking it was their fault. Now these are some of the do says. So first off, sometimes you just have to listen. You don't have to say anything. Um, the more you know per the person, you, the more you can just say, "Well, what, what can I do? Do you want do you want me to listen? Do you want a hug? Do you what you know? What should I do for you to help you through whatever you're going with?" Um, and then these are just a lot of a lot of things that I still struggle to remember um, when people come up and and want to talk to me. Um, but it's it's really helpful to just listen to what they what they have to say. Uh, there's one thing that you can do uh, that actually works really well for me. Um, it's kind of like a, um, a safety word for depression or anxiety attacks or whatever. Uh, so like use pineapple or porcupine or whatever. And uh, when you use that word, like if you're in a huge setting of people and like crowds are bothering you, you can talk to that one person. If you can't speak, you can just say the one safe word and they'll know, you know, what you need to to get out of that uh, situation. So it's like a safe word for your mental health. Uh, mine happens a lot of times at longer conferences. Uh, I notice just because, you know, lack of sleep. I work from home, so I'm never around people. And now I'm just surrounded by this massive amount of people. I'm not getting any sleep. I'm eating like shit. I'm drinking a whole bunch. I forget to take my medications. All of that wrapped into one really, really just kind of throws off your whole routine. Um, so keeping a good routine um, and, and having someone you can talk to wherever you go is, is extremely helpful. And uh, secondly, another thing that you should understand is sometimes they just might not feel like going out. Um, the thoughts of crowds, uh, enclosed spaces, uh, you know, dirty public restrooms, um, stuff like that just is like torture, you know, no matter what. And sometimes there's nothing that you can do to help that. Uh, there's a great article that a friend sent to me um, called This is How You Love Somebody with Anxiety. And a lot of the points in there were completely spot on. Um, uh, one of the things was uh, silence kills anyone with anxiety. It creates problems in their mind that aren't even there. It ends in apologies that aren't even needed. I talked about messing up all those relationships before. It's because I'm just apologizing and thinking things are happening because, you know, if they're silent, I, I must have, I must have fucked something up. You know, it's something I said, something I did. Um, so all of those horrible things are going on in my head and, you know, it just kills them. 
And uh, so even though I suffer from, from this myself, um, I, I will find myself at a loss for, loss for words, but saying, is it, are you okay? Can I help? Um, and uh, obviously nothing's better than a blanket for it. Uh, so not, as only, not only is it difficult to talk about this from the beginning, but so many other things come into play that make you want to kind of bottle up and force it to go away. Uh, I want to show you uh, a couple of things that our community is already doing. One of them is ironin.com. That's I-R-0-N-I-N.com. It's a really good um, uh, site that just kind of piles a whole lot of like mental health, imposter syndrome, that kind of stuff, all together in one website for, for you to uh, see. And then the semicolon project, which, which is all about um, trying to get the stigma away from mental, talking about mental health. And then this video from Mubix, I think, do I have sound? I should have checked before I walked up here. I'll, I'll just put this. I'll just put this near if I don't have sound. Oh shit! I don't have internet. Uh, this is Mubix. Fuck. All right, hopefully I don't show you anything terrible. All right. Turn Wi-Fi on. Play. Maybe. Aw, come on. No. It's a really good video. That's all right. I don't have that much time anyways. Anyways, this is about hacking. I do? I only have six minutes. Is there no, f no food yet? There's no food yet? All right. All right. Shit. Now I'm going to have, like, all my Slack notifications come across the screen, and uh, this is horrible. Oh, there we go. All right, here goes. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rob Fuller, and I'm a hacker. Now, every single one of you watching probably has a different definition of what that might be. But I guarantee not a single one of those definitions includes race, creed, color, religion, sexual preference, or anything in between. The hacker community is filled with human beings, people from all walks of life. In our community, like any social community, there are people among us friends, acquaintances, con buddies that have problems that many of you might not even know they have. We have lost too many of those friends to suicide, drugs, alcohol, depression, and crime. Many of us dove into the world of computers and the internet because it was a place of acceptance. But there's a dark side to this world. It is too easy to disconnect. To miss those markers when all you see is what someone tweets or IMs. We can't see when you hurt, when you cry. There are many ways to help us that need it and are afraid to ask because one of the biggest biases we still have in our community is showing weakness. But you can let those around you know you care, that you are there for them, and the door is open to talk anytime. But one of the best ways is just to be around each other. Hang out, go to a movie, have a good time talk about your day, to be a true friend, not just another face in the lobby of a conference. If you wish to join me in this fight, please make a video, or just tell your friends, your con buddies, or your acquaintances that you just see at that lobby con that we are all hacking together. I'm so glad that played. I love that video. So that, you know, that drives home a lot of the points I was trying to make already. And that, that dude's a badass. If he can talk about his feelings, so can you. Uh, so let's do some hacking together. My door, my DMs, well, kind of my DMs, I guess, are open. Um, phone number, anything, are, are always ta open to talk about anything that's on your mind. Um, a lot of times when I'm feeling, like, lonely or disconnected, I'll just fire up, like, a Google Hangout and tweet out the link, and then just wait until it fills up, and then that's it, right? Um, and then, you know, like, we just talk about your day. Talk about your daily life. My kids come on and say hi, that kind of stuff. Um, now, this is the one that always makes me cry, and I'm going to try really hard not to. Uh, so I think the saddest part of the survey results I got... Oh, it's already starting. 
uh, uh, were uh, the answers to the question, have you ever felt like you weren't worth much as a person? And 50% of the people said yes. And that like breaks my heart every time I think about that. <clears throat> so I feel like having more of an open dialogue and killing it as a taboo thing to talk about is going to go a long way towards fixing it. Uh, so let's just be more compassionate together t- towards each other, whether you like a person or not. Um, you know, it's it's very important, and we've already lost too many people. Uh, so these are a bunch of different ways. Like, if you don't like talking on the phone like I don't, right, you can just text places or talk to them online. There's specific um, uh, groups for, like, LGBT youth, uh, youth, military veterans, general hotlines, that kind of stuff that are nationwide. And then I finish up with a picture of a cute puppy <laughs> to cheer you up uh, so you can go eat. Because I know the first time I gave this talk, my my uh, 16-year-old was in the audience. And I'm like, hey, what'd you think? Do you know, think I did a good job? It's like, mom, boy, was that a downer. <laughs> uh, so to recap the things that you should remember, you're definitely not alone if you're struggling. Get help if you need it. Um, be compassionate to others and... Just, yeah, that's it. So thank you so much. This is me uh, on Twitter. I podcast, I write, stuff like that. So <laughs> do you want another talk? Like, I have more. <laughs> Uh, any questions on any of the research I did or like what goes on in my head, I guess? I don't know. <laughs> or you can talk to me afterwards. It doesn't matter. All good? Go Well, not yet. You can't eat, but go get a drink. Self-medicate. <laughs> oh, get the chairs? Yeah, if everybody could help get the chairs and put them somewhere. Is that your job? Yeah, so everybody, thank you. If you could just take a few chairs. Uh, We're going to stack them over.